We're going to start out this morning with a couple of questions just so we can get to know who is in the room with us here today. So I'm going to ask you to just raise your hands as we answer these together. Raise your hand if you were brought into this world by parents. Okay, made sure everybody had a little minute to think about it. All right, didn't want to have to go any further. Uh, Next question, raise your hand if you were at one point a kid. Okay, great. We all have some shared experience this morning as we lean into this conversation together about families that are on mission, specifically today, families that are strategic in the mission of growing kids who follow Jesus, who are going to help other people follow Jesus. And I don't know about you when you were growing up, if you ever thought that your parents or grandparents or whoever it was that raised you, at birth, they were given like a coach's playbook outlining each and every scenario that you were to expect as a parent and then how you would respond. I remember clearly being in the delivery room with my wife and our newborn son, Jude, and we were having friends that stopped by. We had family that stopped by. They were bringing food and gifts and praying with us and encouraging us, and the nurses that we had in the delivery room, they were incredible at helping out brand new mom and dad. And then I clearly remember a nurse coming in and telling us, you have to leave. You can't stay here anymore. And I know that they couldn't come home with us, I may have asked, but I remember being given no playbook, no list of scenarios of what to expect over a lifetime of parenting, and internally, not out loud, because I wanted to at least give the appearance to my spouse that I I thought I knew what I was doing, but I was thinking, oh my goodness, they're actually letting us take this little human home, and it is our responsibility to train him, to raise him. And there were these great feelings of excitement also paired with some fear because by that point in our life, in our mid to late 20s, I and Victoria had spent a lot of our time around teenagers and around parents of teenagers and I saw things to celebrate and that made me excited about being a parent and I also saw some things that that scared me about being a dad. And if you are here this morning and you are not a parent, here is what parents would tell you. It is difficult. If you are a single parent, they would tell you that it is even more challenging. If you're an empty nester and your kids have grown up and they've moved out of the house, you might be sitting there just arms crossed laughing a little bit because you know what the rest of us have to expect and are going to maybe experience over the course of the, of the coming years or in the near future. And if you're here this morning and you don't have kids, what we talk about is going to be helpful for you. So I'm going to ask you, please don't check out because unless you never leave your home, your life is going to intersect with a family. You're going to cross paths with some kids, whether it's your neighbors or you are or a coach, or you're a relative, and there's kids at family gatherings, or you're a part of this church, this series about being a family on mission applies to every single one of us because we are each called to play a part in encouraging and equipping the families, the kids that God has blessed us with. And we believe the biggest influence in shaping the faith of the next generation is the home. And as a church, our strategy is to partner with parents and grandparents and families to live out the calling as the primary faith influencers in the life of their child as the church, as we in this room, come alongside them to equip them and encourage them. And this is not just what is happening in kids' ministry downstairs. This is not just what is taking place in the hour that we have with teenagers across the street. This is the posture. This is the the posture of ministry that we as the entire church take in encouraging our families. Now, I have the the blessing and the privilege to serve as our student minister at First Christian Church, so you're going to hear from me from the student ministry perspective, but I also want you to hear from me as a dad and as a husband. As a dad who has 
two amazing little boys who are growing up in this church. My family needs you. Our families that we see and we cross paths with, pass, pass with in the hall, we need you. Chap Clark is a professor of youth, family, and culture at Fuller Theological Seminary, and he wrote a book called Adoptive Church, Creating an Environment Where Emerging Generations Belong. And in this book, he explains that the goal is to help our kids develop a lifelong faith in Jesus that empowers them to live fully in Jesus' family, the church, that it's not enough to make our kids individual disciples of Jesus. The church is not meant to be a network of isolated worshipers, but is called to be a whole new kind of family. The gift of Jesus gives us the right to become children of God, adopted into his family, to learn how to live and be a growing follower of Jesus in the context of the family that he has given to us all, that we believe in Jesus, we are all adopted children of the King. And First Christian Church family, we have this opportunity to live out our calling as a family and adopt others into the family of God, because this, this is what we do, right? Because this is what has been done for us. So this morning, I don't have a detailed roadmap of all the situations that our families need to anticipate or should plan for. What I do have are some encouragements in what it looks like to be a strategic family that is on mission. Our verse that's going to guide us this morning is Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Steve said it so well last week that the Bible has a lot to say about the responsibility of parents to pass on the faith to the next generation, but nowhere does it say that parents are responsible for the faith of the next generation. We believe that we will be held accountable for how we lead our kids into a relationship with Jesus, but we're not accountable for what our kids do after the opportunities provided to them to to follow after Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Church, we are not trying to raise perfect kids. Parents, we are not going to parent perfectly. We are just pointing to the one who is. Moms and dads, if you haven't figured it out, like after day one, at some point, we're going to blow it. We, we're going to mess up. We will have regrets. In six and a half years of, of parenting, I have regrets. Our kids need to know that parents, mom and dad, we don't think that we are perfect. And when we mess up, what we do is we ask our kids for forgiveness and we point them to the reality, hey, mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, we need Jesus too. Parents with grown kids, if we've, if we've messed up, if there's been something that has never been reconciled, maybe for us this morning, maybe what we need to do is we need to go back to our grown children and ask for forgiveness. And we don't control the outcomes of what happens after that, but I want us to hear this morning, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, you need to know that you cannot out what Jesus has done for us on the cross. What Satan wants is for us to focus on where we've blown it, on where we've messed up, and miss out on how God is going to use us today. Reggie Joyner, he's the founder of Orange Curriculum, helping churches raise kids in the home and raise kids in the church and to partner those two together. He says, God is at work telling a story of restoration and redemption through your family. Never buy into the myth that you need to become the right kind of parent before God can use you in your children's lives. Instead, learn to cooperate with whatever God desires to do in your heart today so your children will have a front row seat to the grace and the goodness of God. Because we have a God who redeems and we have a God who can restore. 
Now we also know as intentional and as strategic as we may be, our kids aren't robots. They are not puppets, they have free will, and we know sometimes to our own heartbreak and disappointment, our children choose not to follow the way that we have taught them. And I want you to know in this room that we can be honest about the hurt and maybe the pain that we have experienced. You need to know that you have a group of trusted people in this space, in this church family that are here and are with you, that we never give up hope because we know that our God is the God of hope, that we love our kids no matter where they are or what they're doing. And we keep on praying for them. Because something that is out of our control is the spiritual growth, maturity, and development of other people in the lives of our kids We can guide and direct, we train and we trust. So parents, hear this as we start. Grandparents, hear this as we start. We parent and raise up kids not out of fear, but out of faith. Faith in what God is doing in their life and faith in what God is doing in our life as well. Strategic families start with the end in mind. Strategic families start with the end in mind. I want us to think about the end. It's not a new strategy. People in business, people in the marketplace do this all the time, asking questions of what is the one-year or the three-year or the five-year goal? So, So what do we hope to accomplish when this is all said and done? As we talk about strategic families, what do we hope to accomplish in the end? We want our kids to follow Jesus for a lifetime. That's the goal. We want our kids to follow Jesus for a lifetime. Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, it tells us, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We know that our days go so, so quickly. Raise your hand if you're on Facebook. All right. I have a love, not really a hate relationship. I think hate's a strong word, but I have a love. We're gonna gonna say hate relationship with Facebook. And if you're not familiar with what Facebook is, it's a social media platform. And you just need to know this morning, none of our younger kids are on it. It's all for old people now. I am on it. None of our students are using this platform today. One function on Facebook is a little tab that you can click that says memories. And what the memory tab does, you can see a specific memory that you shared from years ago. On Facebook, I usually just share pictures for my friends and family to see that we don't live physically close to. And over the past few months, as I've clicked on memory, memories just to see what's been coming up, uh, what we're going to celebrate over the past coming years, I've, I've noticed two things. I've noticed in the past few years how much more hair I used to have. And then the other thing, I've seen how quickly our boys are growing up. And I think about what has happened so quickly in just a few years. And church, if we don't stop to reflect and think about that and remember that time goes quickly, we are going to miss out on a lot if we don't slow down and pay attention to the time that we have. There is a 100% certainty that our kids will someday stand before Jesus. We want to be mindful of the time that we have with them and the direction that we are pointing them in. This command in Proverbs 22.6 says to start children off in the way they should go. Some translations say in in the way that we train them, to train them. It's this picture of what a mom or a dad does for for a little baby, a little infant that doesn't know how to eat yet. In the beginning, we make sure not just that our, our tiny little baby has food, but that we take it to them and we make sure that it is easily accessible. We don't tell our newborn, we don't tell our young child, hey, there's food in there, we're gonna let you figure this out, we're gonna let you navigate this on your own. That's not what we do. We train them to take the food of life and bring it to them so they will find the appropriate nourishment that they need. We give a bottle to a baby so when they are young so that when they are old, we don't have to do that anymore. 
That we start children out in the way that they should go. In the beginning, a child is 100% dependent upon us. In a couple years, they're 90%, then 80%, then 70%. And this whole process of growing up is the process of our children beginning to move on to the next phase, moving from dependence to independence. And a great question for us to think about as we talk about being a family that is strategic as a mom and dad, as a grandparent, as a church that has influence in the life of our kids, a great question is what kind of posture does it take to guide our kids toward Jesus? What kind of posture does it take to guide our kids towards Jesus? It takes sensitivity to our children that we understand their individual needs. That we know them so well that we know their gifts, we know their strengths, we know their weaknesses, we know the things that are gonna be temptations for them. That they can come to us and they can say anything and they know that we still love them, that we are a safe place for our kids to navigate each phase of life, that because we love them, because we have open and honest communication with them and they trust us, we know, they know that we will be there to help them navigate difficult things. It takes discipline. That we have a willingness to get involved in the affairs of life with our children, especially when they have done wrong, to correct with grace and truth. It takes flexibility. Raise your hand if you have have been parenting and you've discovered that what worked yesterday in raising your kid isn't working, it's not working the next day, right? What worked yesterday maybe won't work the next day or what worked last month isn't gonna work the next month. As our children grow up, the methods have to change. We have to be flexible in how we parent, but still having the same missional direction. It takes diligence and time that we stick with our children because raising children today is hard. It's not one day a month, it's not one month a year. It takes a specific investment of our heart and of our mind. Parents in the room this morning or watching online, grandparents, if you are the main influencer in the life of your grandchild, you are the primary influence in your kid's life. The only time that shifts is when a parent or a parent influence withdraws physically or emotionally from the life of a child. Our kids don't need us to be their best friend. Our kids don't need us to be another peer. What our kids need is a model for them to look up to. They need us to be present. Strategic families are fully present. In Deuteronomy 6, Moses is standing before the people of Israel. They're preparing to head into the promised land, and he challenged them as a nation. He challenged them as families to be a people who follow, honor, and love God. In Deuteronomy 6, uh, verse 5, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. This, this next section, I love this picture of presence that we see. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. It gives this picture of being fully present. It's something that takes time. There are not quick fixes to being a family on mission. We can't parent in a hurry. I've tried to parent in a hurry. It does not, does not turn out well. Being present isn't just being around or in physical proximity to our kids. So question, a, a really a gut check question, as we think about presence, is it our body or is it our whole heart that is present? Do our kids know that we are available? Does our spouse know that we are available? Are we accessible? Do they perceive that we are, in present, are present and engaged? Church, as we pass with kids and families, are we engaged with the kids that God has placed in this community? Do we notice them? Do we talk to them? Do we encourage them? 
And if the answer is no, the great thing is, for some of us, that's just some mid-course corrections. When we are a parent, when we are a grandparent, when we are a family that is strategic, we sacrifice things. We sacrifice our comfort, the things that we want. We know as a primary influence in the life of a kid that we are not going to be able to be 100% constant and physically present in their life 100% of the time. But what we can be is we can be consistent. So a question we're going to ask is what is something we are doing for ourselves that is taking time away from our family? What is something we are doing for ourselves that is taking time away from our family, from our kid, from our spouse? What is preventing us from showing up in the lives of our kids? I think one of the biggest hindrances in being present is is this. If you have one of these next to you, just go, go ahead and hold it up right now. And I'm going to say this because I don't want this to be misinterpreted. This is not evil. This is not from Satan. I use this. I use technology. But I do think one of the biggest hindrances to being present with our family is the accessibility to technology and the misuse of it. I see so often and... I know I've been guilty of this before as well, seeing a mom or dad, you know, next, next to your kid, next to little Timmy that's right here, and they're asking you a question, and we're, we're just doing this. If our kid is right next to us and we are on our phone, we are not fully present. Raise your hand if you have a Bluetooth in your car and you can talk on the phone through your Bluetooth speaker because you know if you held your phone, that is illegal and that's something we don't do, right? Here's, here's an encouragement. When you have your kids, when you have your family with you in the car, don't talk on the phone. They're trapped. They have, they have nowhere else to go. You have them 100% with you all the time. I see some kids are like, no, I don't, no, I don't want to do that. But you are able to be present with them to have important conversations, to laugh, to have a conversation, to talk with them. At home, we can shut off the phone for a period of time and just be present with our family. The problem is, if we are constantly 100% available to everyone else all of the time, it can hurt the relationships that matter the most. So maybe we need to set up some boundaries for ourselves Before we were to give our kid or our grandkid a phone, we need to set up some boundaries for them. Phones are not evil, but we do need time to be totally available to our kids. We need to unplug. Being fully present lets our kids, lets our family know that they are valuable, that they are important, that they have our full attention. Strategic families invite trusted adults into the mission with them. And I'm going to talk specifically just to our grandparents and our older adults for a moment. You are so important to our kids. You are so important to your grandkids. You're so important to the kids in this family because I believe many of you have learned some things about being present that we, that, that we can learn from you, that we need you to teach us. I believe that many of you are not always tied to your phone or don't want to be tied to your phone or, or maybe you don't know how to be tied to your phone. You can teach us about being present. Adult who have kids in your life now, adults who don't have kids in your life now, we need you to be a role model. We need you to share our burdens. We need you to speak truth lovingly to our families. We need you to encourage us. We need you to build us up. I'm going to challenge you, if you don't have a family that you are pouring into, invite a family into your life. Families that have kids that are growing up right now, we need to be receptive to other people pointing us in the right direction, to other people pouring into our life. 
Just this past week, Jude and I were at Menards, probably buying something that we didn't need. Uh, It's our favorite store. We love it so much. And we were walking the aisles, seeing what was new, and we ran into a trusted friend from church that immediately started a conversation with my son. And his face lit up. He absolutely loved talking to her, and now what they're planning is a McDonald's outing with my son and her and her granddaughter. She was fully present and made an impact in the life of my kid by talking to him, by noticing him, by promising french fries, yes, but by being present. And you know what? Like the past two weeks, that is all that he has talked about. He has told his whole class of first graders, hey, this lady from church is taking me to McDonald's. He has one more person in his life from this church family that he knows. I know a lot of people love my kids and see my kids and love our kids and see our kids, but that he knows loves him. And that he knows wants to spend time with him. Proverbs 22.6 gives us the command to train a child, to show them the right direction to go so that when they are older, there is a greater likelihood in the same direction that you have started them on. And we ask, what's, what's that direction? It's teaching them in the right way, which is teaching them in God's way, in the way of righteousness and holiness and truth that we see in the Bible. It is not train up a child in the way that they would go. It is to train up a child in the way that they should go. So practically, what does that look like for strategic families? It means that strategic families strive to instill specific traits in their kids. And I'm going to share just three this morning. Know that there are many more that we should be striving to instill in the life of our kids, but these are important. And honestly, church, this is for adults as well. These are traits that we want to see produced in our life as well, as we want our kids to be confident. We want them to have confidence, not that they would be arrogant, but that they would have confidence in whose they are. They would have a high sense of self-worth because of who has given them life, because they are created in the image of God, that their identity would be in Jesus, that they would know what Psalm 139, 13 and 14 says, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well, that we would raise confident kids, kids who are confident in their identity in Jesus, that we would raise kids who have character, that we would strive to instill Christ-like character in their life, that they would have convictions, they would have beliefs, not just based upon what they feel in any given moment, but based upon a biblical worldview that shapes their character, that shapes how they see the world and decisions that they make, that they would think about things that we see in Philippians 4.8, where Paul writes, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, that they would think about such things that we would raise kids that are servants, that are servant-minded, that they would compassionately focus on others, not themselves, not their preferences, not their wants, but would be humble servants that point to Jesus, the one who has served us in the greatest way ever. Philippians chapter two, verses five through eight, we read, in your relationships with one another, Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, that we would be raising humble servants. We should have an idea 
of the qualities and traits we are trying to see nurtured in the lives of our kids. We want them to have a big picture from the Bible of how Jesus has called us to live and contribute to the world in a way that has a for now and forever kingdom impact, that they believe that they're not just taking up space in the world, that they were created on purpose for a purpose. That means as we parent, as we do this family thing, that we parent in intentional ways not reactive ways. Not always reacting to something that's happened, but instead being proactive because strategic families consistently point to Jesus. The goal of Christian parenting is create an atmosphere that makes it easy to start following Jesus. Not that it's always easy to follow Jesus, but that it makes it easy to start. Removing obstacles and hindrances and roadblocks, so that means that we teach the truth of Scripture We bring them here regularly for worship. We have faith conversations that are ongoing that we introduce them to this community of faith, that we give our kids the truth of the gospel, that Jesus is the only way, that he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life. The goal for our families is to have a relationship with Jesus, to have a relationship with our kids and with others that make it easy for our children to start following in our steps. That should be the goal for our church. That as they watch, our kids are watching. This morning I've got two little boys that are backstage that I think they're here today. And they sometimes just like to see what what dad is doing, what dad does. So this is this is Jude. And this is Ezra. Our kids are watching. This morning, my boys, our kids that are in this service, our kids that will be in next service, they are watching and they are seeing a family that they know is going to pray for them. They're seeing a family that they know is going to encourage them. They're seeing a family that has and will continue to welcome them into this community that provides a mold for what it looks like to follow Jesus. Our hopes for our kids, our hopes for uh, our, my boys, it's not found in what they're going to do when they grow up. It's not found in the success that they will have someday. It's not found in me, it's not found in my wife, it's not found in mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. Our hopes for our kids are found in Jesus. That's why we parent with the end in mind, knowing one day that they will stand before Jesus. That's why we are fully present. That's why we have welcomed you adults into the mission with us. That's why we point to Jesus in all that we do. They need us to lead. The very first Sunday that our family was worshiping from home during COVID, Victoria and I started a a Sunday rhythm that looked very similar for the weeks that we were at home. Uh, We would get our boys' little rocking chairs out. We would move them into the family room. We would get their instruments so that they could play along and they could sing with the songs that we were singing uh, on the screen. We got their story Bibles so that they could read and watch and look. And they were four and one and a half at the time. And usually how church at home often looked was loud with They are being so great this morning. Usually at home worship, they were crawling around. We were singing. They were laughing. We were crying. There were diapers being changed. When we have family worship, it often looks uh, like this, much what it looks like in in person. And what our kids did most worshiping from home is they watched mom and dad. And they still do. The very first Sunday, as we got ready to take communion, we got out our, our cup of juice we didn't, have, we didn't have these, but we got a cup of juice and we got a saltine cracker. And we started to break the cracker in half, Victoria and I did, and, and Jude, our oldest, he asked, what are you doing? 
And I don't know if he was genuinely curious or he knew that there was like a whole fresh sleeve that wasn't, you know, wasn't stale of saltine crackers in the kitchen and we could have all that we would want, but he, he asked. So what we did is we pressed pause on the live stream because we didn't want to rush past an important conversation. So we explained to him so that he could understand how much Jesus loves him, how much Jesus loves us. We talked about sin, about when mom and dad mess up. We talked about Jesus dying on the cross to save us. We talked about what the juice and the bread represent. We talked about why we do this every time that we worship, why we remember why this is important. And that conversation played out very often in our home on family Sundays when our kids are with us, not just our kids, but all of our kids. I know that there are similar conversations that are happening, that our kids are seeing what's taking place. So this morning, we're gonna take communion together. And what we are gonna be is we are gonna be fully present. We are not gonna rush past This time, we know that this is the most united moment of our worship service this morning. And if you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we invite you into this time and we remember the great love for us and Jesus on the cross. We do this every Sunday, meaning that we consistently point to Jesus, that we preach the good news about Jesus to all our kids who watch, to adults that are here who have not trusted Jesus yet, we proclaim what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We take communion with the end in mind, knowing one day that all will be made new, that all will be made right. We know that Jesus is returning. We invite you to take the bread in your own time and then we will take the cup together. Let's pray this morning. Father, we are so thankful for the gift of your son. We are so thankful that you love us so much not to leave us where we are, but that you bring forgiveness and you bring restoration and you bring healing. And we are so joyful that we have been set set free, not by anything that we have done, but by what Jesus has done for us. And we praise you that this is life that is not just for the people in this room, but that this is life. This is the hope for all generations. We remember your death. We know that you defeated death by rising from the grave and that in you we have been adopted into your kingdom forever. And we know that you are returning. And Father, we long and we look forward to your return. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.